Yes, thank you. So we are going to the to the next round table, not really a round, uh, but uh, uh, this session will be about uh, investing on the art market. And the first presentation is about Anne-Sophie Radar-Mikea. And I am very glad uh, to see this kind of presentation because most often when discussing about the art market, we focus on the top of the market and on billionaire auction, etc., etc. And here we have another presentation, uh, quite original, about the law and art market. And Sophie, if you can present, thank you. Thank you very much, Nathalie. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, yes, this presentation is entitled Investing in the Law and Art Market, with a question mark. So this is a follow-up of, of my PhD uh, dissertation that was dedicated to the market for anonymous art at the auction from the contemporary uh, approach. And this is a preliminary research to uh, hopefully another pro research project dedicated to the economics of marginal heritage. So artworks, cult cultural goods, which are outdated and branded, indeterminate or uh, informal. And when working on the market for anonymous old masters, inevitably uh, I had to look at what we call the, the low end art market which is surrounded by many stereotypes, unbranded works, cheaper prices, little knowledge. Um, and of course, for these reasons, it's not always the main focus of scholarly attention and media and press attention either. But we know that the art market is a polarized market. So with a high concentration of value at the top and a high concentration of volume at the bottom. And this is reflected in uh, these figures by um, McAndrew report, which is which are quite uh, striking. The relevance of that kind of topic right now in 2021 is also linked to the quite unexpected performance of the low and secondary art market throughout COVID-19 uh, crisis. This is a parallel research I've done on the low end art market, and this is one of the main output of this uh, research. So my questions for this presentation was, and this is one question among others, uh, how do art market players involved in the low-end art market interpret the notion of investment? When we look, when we look at the uh, literature about art as an investment, of course, we have to look at economics and finance uh, with researchers who started to pay attention to that um, financialization of the art market by the mid 80s, the financialization that dates back uh, around the uh, 70s, with mostly two perspectives, art as an investment and in the aggregate terms and models buildings. Usually the primary data that are used are obviously auction public prices, uh, most of the time of a quite established artist. They do uh, mostly price indices uh, as a tool for investment using various methods such as hedonic regression or repeat sales regressions. And here we have a, a panel of uh, studies uh, which different purposes, but each of them uh, discuss the issue of returns when investing in art to some extent. And the main output of this research, and it, it's quite well known actually, it's the limited financial returns from artworks and the interest of art in terms of portfolio diversification. There are other characteristics of art as an investment, aesthetic pleasure, utility deriving from conspicuous consumption, or also endowment effect. But what we can notice is that with all these recent research, most of the time, what they, what they try to do is to estimate rates of returns or to improve current methods to get more accurate rates uh, and prediction. And arguably, in that context, the low end art market is not uh, of prime uh, interest. One reason of that is that we don't know much actually uh, about the low, what we call the low end art market. Um, we are in organized and disorganized markets. And according to Bogdanova, the low end art market would be part of these disorganized markets, including uh, some contemporary art galleries, antique stores provincial, local, small auction houses, but also flea markets and garage sales. There are um, some papers in pure economics that say that actually the low end market is important because at some point it can also enhance profit maximization for higher hand incumbent firms. So having a low end market is also a good thing. 
And in the low and art market, we're going to find mostly um, what we call retail commercial galleries, that is galleries which are not uh, involved in promotion or innovation works. There is this quality issue often reported in the low end art market with what we call low grow art or chromos, basically works which have no uh, significant cultural or artistic value. On the other end, Francine Couture, who studied that market for the chromos, uh, considered this market as a fully fledged cultural industry, which I tend to agree with. Nevertheless, the, bond, the boundaries are quite blurred, and I'm not going to discuss um, too much that visualization, but what we see is that sometimes in the low-end art market, we have the upper end of the low-end art market, which is more in the middle end market, just like in the high-end market, we can see that the low end of the high-end might be in the middle art market. We see that, for instance, with the first uh, pictures I showed on the front um, slide with Sotheby's now uh, involved in the low end market with some works uh, selling for 250 uh, euros. Here is a recap table I could I can provide based on some research I have made with the main stereotypes surrounding the low end art market and the different this vertical differentiation of the art market with two extremes on the one hand the top end market and on the other end the low end market. So what's interesting is here, in terms of buying incentives, we have at the top hand market investment, conspicuous consumption, while presumably in the low end, that would be only about decorative purposes. In terms of aspiration level for the, con the buyers, that would be extremely high. So in terms of social distinction, while it would be low in the low end market. And in terms of quality, uncertainty, and expertise, we see here, uh, of course, there, are all, there is always uncertainty on the market, even in the high hands, but proportionally lower than in the uh, low end market because expertise knowledge are higher in the, the high hand market. And that is the contrary um, in the low end market. In terms of price ranges, these are from, uh, again, uh, McAndrew report. Uh, they are disputable, I think, uh, but this is the kind of price ranges we have to describe each uh, market segment. There are very, very few studies about the low-end art market to the best, at least of my knowledge, and in, from a contemporary uh, approach. In general economics, we have uh, studies on firms active in the low-end market, which an interesting things, uh, according to several papers, um, firms, pioneer firms, firms in the low-end market tend to provide higher quality. So we see this quality differentiation or, or also in the low end market. In cultural economics, I didn't find many studies at all. We have Ginsburg and Bowens. They look at Christie's and Sotheby's, but they look at uh, English silverware, which is another kind of goods that we found as well in the, also in the low end market. Canals and Serda, which, uh, who focuses on uh, eBay art auction, um, showing that the reputation, the notion of reputation of the seller also matters in the online art auction on eBay. So we are also in the low end market. And then Vozilov, who studied the market for sculpture and its potential for investment by also looking at the middle low end markets. In terms of price determinants, so we often believe that it's an unbranded market with unbranded words. There are names, though. Um, and there might be other price determinants that play a greater role um, in this market segment, like craftsmanship, material quality, the condition, the craft value, the use value as well of these objects, especially for antiques and uh, collectibles, the storytelling as cognitive support as well. But more broadly, what we see is that uh, technically the behaviors in this market segment would be intuitively non-investment oriented. And we have this citation from a paper from the New York Times dated 1993, which tend to say that, although it does not entirely reject the possibility of investment in the low end art market. And we have other authors who state that, yes, antiques and collectibles might have uh, a bargaining power and on the market for chromos um, there will oh, it's a place where there will always be uh, small capitals invested they are small but they are capital invested anyway 
So to carry out this research, um, exploratory research, I have um, conducted 15 semi-structure interviews uh, among low-end art market intermediaries based on my, in my hometown, town uh, Liège, which is in Belgium. And that's interesting because on the European art market, Belgium only represents three persons, London excluded. So it's almost nothing. In Belgium, it's mostly about uh, Brussels, a little bit of Flanders, and Wallonia in that part is completely on the margins. But interestingly, I could find five, at least five auction houses in Liège, um, several antique dealers and galleries as well. And there is a, a institutional recognition of this market via the museum field that, with an event that takes place every year where the museum um, showcases the work of these uh, contemporary galleries. One a major output, I think, from this uh, preliminary research is, as I said before, the impact of uh, COVID-19 crisis on the low-end art market with a shift in spending habits uh, that created, that seems to have created uh, some sort of pent-up demand at the benefit of the secondary market in particular, with that experience is actually uh, quite unexpected performances over the past months. And my assumption in this case would be but it's just an assumption, the possible effect of the combination between the hedonic and utilitarian values of antiques and some old objects, including furnitures uh, and things like that. From the investment perspective, there are uh, four main uh, themes that came out from, this, uh, from these interviews. A booming market, investment from the buyer's perspective, potential profit on single works or categories of artworks, and investment from the intermediary perspective. I don't spend too much time on the examples, but I have highlighted what is particularly striking. So we have here a booming market with that kind of testimonies, um, how business is doing even better. We reach all the prices again for certain art pieces. I'm dealing more with work of a few hundred euros and a few thousands. There are opportunities for less important budgets. The market is booming. I've never seen that before. Prices are between 10 to 25 percent higher than before the crisis. Online auction uh, are skyrocketing for the moment. Uh, now, hammer prices exceed more and more the highest estimates. It's just a selection of a uh, compelling uh, example. Potential profit on single artworks or categories of artworks. Certain pieces can make very good investments. Some pieces that we would not accept for sales in the 90s now sell for several thousands euros. Value fluctuates. 10 years ago, a closet could sell for five to 6,000 euros. Now we throw them away in the garbage. It's more about 70s and uh, 60s and 70s furniture. With antiques, it's always good to invest even a small amount of money. You never know what will happen in 10 or 20 years. And there is also this notion, this emphasis on the material value of some furniture in particular. From the buyer's perspective, uh, we have these key words uh, coming out from time to time. There's maybe a speculation effect for certain goods. It's the right moment to buy. People can still access more historical works at a better price. Art remain a good investment. If you do have an eye for investment, you should go for things that are old fashioned. I would not call that an investment, but at least people start realizing that they object, old objects have an economic value. And if people start liking, like, uh, thinking like that, there will be some sort of inflation. I don't think it's an intentional investment, but yeah, you can make money at provincial auction. And then now we have the intermediary perspective. Uh, which is also interesting because a bit more varied. So we have here, I can easily resell it twice or three times the purchase purchase price this is obviously the goal of the resale market. Here, this notion of investment um, based on the notion of time, my time, time, time. Um, and it, it came out regularly actually during the interviews. I think books are what cost me the most so far. It's essential in this job to make your knowledge grow. That's key. So there is really this notion about investing in expertise, in knowledge, which is something that happens, of course, also in the high-end market. But in the low-end market, I think it's also very interesting. I expect to make at least 50% on resales. That will make my day. 
Um, the more you learn, the more you want to learn. That's in my head all the time, 24-7. Um, investing in social relationships is also necessary. It's all about network. And in fact, that's some sort of investment because that makes you save a lot of time and money at the end. So this notion also of so, yeah, uh, social relationships, which seems to be also important in the low end market. I've known people for years, now their kids are buying in my store. Um, I try to spend at least one hour and a half per day to read and keep up with recent sales and new books on artists. So still this notion of expertise, expertise that has a price and that people do not always realize because of internet and they want everything quickly and for free. And these two last citations are very interesting because be, be, during the pandemics, some respondents noticed the emergence or at least the appearance of pseudo experts, pseudo sellers, um, which apparently are bad for the reputation for the business. So it would, it would tend to say that it's some about reputational markets as well. Uh, and this is also interesting because it's very much connected to another paper that states that in times of crisis, when the market is booming, this is also the place for uh, fakes and forgeries, or well, at least uh, frauds. So that was a quick uh, overview. Um, based on this, I think it's important also to get back to the main definitions of investment. Obviously, in many research, we use the notion of investment as uh, a way to allocate money in an asset with the expectation of a positive benefit returned in the future. I also like the distinction between um, benefit and returns. So that's what is most studies are concerned with. However, if we look further at other meaning of investment, we have the act of putting money, in, money into a business to buy new stocks, machines, so the resource investment. The act of putting money a fourth time into something to make a profit or to get an advantage or to achieve a result. This notion of putting energy and effort into something, which is something I really felt when uh, carrying out the interviews uh, over the past month. And even more interesting, there is another extended definition of investment. Um, which is approach and wrapping manner to dominate someone, to capture its confidence or to seduce him or her. And it's in psychology, fixation of an effective energy on an object, which is thus charged with a particular meaning for the subject. And I think in that regard, that relates quite well with what I could find in my interviews uh, in terms of investing as a hobby or investing uh, putting knowledge and effort into gaining uh, expertise um, in that market segment. So what can we do with that? Uh, investing in low-end art object. The good thing is that with the crisis, there is um, a bunch of new fresh data from Drouot Online, Interenchère, Invaluables, Katawiki, uh, but also more and more private antique dealers, even local dealers, which who are uh, disclosing the prices now. It's fixed price, but these are price anyway. And it's very different from what we can find on art price, art net, brand, um, in which it's basically mostly about fine art. So painting, drawings, uh, sculpture, prints. Uh, here we have a much more diversified set of cultural and art objects. An interesting thing is the notion of sleeper in this market segments. So when the identity uh, or the full value of the artwork is not entirely known, uh, if you look at uh, auctions, online auctions, we can see that sometimes prices um, are getting extremely high based on the estimates. And I'm wondering if in a way that kind of sleepers are no, not much more frequent uh, in the low end market than uh, in the high end market. In terms of price dynamics, it is also extremely interesting. We have in terms of pre-sale estimates, we have many starting bids starting at 10 euros. Sometimes we have estimates, sometimes we don't have estimates. Sometimes we have reserve price, sometimes we don't have that, which is very different than from the high-end market. And I was also wondering myself, is there any superstar effect in this low-end market or any conspicuous consumption? Uh, there are names. They are not big names, but there are also names and more valued objects, more research uh, sought after objects. In terms of price formation mechanism, uh, I think it's also as interesting, as I said earlier, to look at the utilitarian value of these goods in terms of material value, craft value, maybe. 
uh, which will require some adaptation of current hedonic model, uh, hedonic pricing models, because we are dealing with more heterogeneous uh, artwork in this case. So this is definitely a challenge, but that can be interesting to tackle. And there is this sentence, which is not from me, but I found it on the internet. And I thought that is actually a very interesting question. Is the low-end market experiences, experiencing the fastest growth? Just to give you a few examples. So we see all these sales with starting bid, uh, I mean, the, the estimate of 10 euros. And three days before the final uh, sale, we, we are already at 410 euros, based on 10 euros. Same here with a lot of regular prints or watercolors with names, there are some names, uh, with estimates at 10. Here we have uh, one uh, uh, antique dealers, and we see that on uh, her website now, the price is disclosed. We have actually quite a lot of information on the work, even though it's a local, locally based um, dealers in this case. And Katawiki, which is also another very interesting website where a private retailer can sell an artwork. There is an expert, she's here. She provides an estimate. The seller himself is uh, rated by the consumers and you can bid uh, at your best convenience until the, the deadline of the sale, which I think is also interesting. And we can see there, there, is, there is not much information, but there is a little bit of information. The other wing of this issue, as I said, so we have the, let's say, financial investment or at least make profit. But here we have also the intellectual capital building process, which also seems very important in the low-end markets with the role of time and expertise that I didn't really expect either in this market segment. And by intellectual, intellectual capital, we have human capital, uh, that is all knowledge experience of a worker within an organization, education, work experience, life experience, plus the relationship capitals. And expertise there can be viewed as some sort of intangible assets to, assets to invest in with in turn returns and profit for the company, new customers, product differentiation, business improvement. That is another, I think, interesting thing to investigate, this notion of reputational market, even in the low-end art market. And how could we control for that? Because, of course, there is no measurement system to assess, uh, to control for expertise. Um, but when we include the variables auction house and hedonic model for Christie's Sotheby's, that doesn't make really sense to uh, further investigate these questions. But when we are in the low-end market, we might control for the local auction houses number of years into business to dis distinguish uh, established firm versus newcomers. Could be the auctioneer's age based on the assumption that older the auctioneer uh, higher the expertise. The distribution by sales type as well. We have catalog sales on the one hand and the vente courante, vente bourgeoise on the other end. The level of specialization with the different categories of works so the more we have object, maybe lower is the specialization, the types of information provided in the catalogs or online, and the accuracy of the description. Sometimes you don't need to be an art historian to realize that, yes, the um, description is not always very accurate. So to quickly conclude, uh, I hope this research shows the importance of doing exploratory research to test that kind of pre uh, pretest that kind of assumptions. This, I think it's important to emphasize the notion of the relative notion of investment. At the lower level, we can buy something 100 euros and we sell it later 500. Uh, it's not about returns, not about dividends, but at least you make a significant profit, which might be proportionally higher than in the middle market or maybe even in the high end market. Um, and I think. It is very much in line with also what Velto says, that there is a middle class that sees art object as object of desire, status symbol, and potential investment. I think this is also important to take into account the broader definition of investment. So money on one hand and on the other hand, intellectual capital. And there are, I think, avenues for research in this low-end art market, which is also interesting because to some extent it better reflects what 
not super wealthy people consume and there are many people who goes to who go to auction uh, regularly to buy uh, object collectibles and antiques and again there are data now which is i think a good uh, outcomes from the crisis and this is my next step actually to provide more empirical analysis on this um, topic so thank you very much thank you and sophie uh, so thank you very much for this presentation. And I think it, uh, the, the, the way you consider investment uh, could, is, is close to the one of cultural capital, social capital. There, there is a link between this kind of investment and social capital, cultural capital, etc., etc. And it could be fine to make a bridge between the two yeah. concepts, in my opinion. Okay. But thank you for this uh, very nice presentation. So we are going to go to next um, presentation uh, uh, about uh, the art market as an un unregulated uh, art market. Uh, so uh, it is uh, Antonia who is going to make the presentation. So thank you. And uh, please, Antonia, could you respect the time? Because uh, I'm sorry to ask you this, because it's very difficult to inter interrupt during the presentation uh, uh, on the internet. So please respect time if we want to have a discussion after. Thank you. So thank okay. you for, the, for your presentation, Antonia. It's your turn. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I'll try to make it short. Uh, let me start by quickly introducing me. My name is Antonia von Appen. I am a PhD student um, at Bocconi University in Milan, Italy. And what I'm going to talk to you about is practically the, um, my PhD project. So um, it is a work in progress. Hence, uh, I do not aim and I don't want to give you a final and definite answer to the title that you see here. Uh, on the slide, but rather I would like to give you an overview of the current status that allows you to recognize the interrelationship um, among finances and art and make maybe at the end of the 20 minutes uh, your own well-founded considerations as to whether you think that stronger re regulation is needed and whether the similarities in the art market and the financial markets allow for let's say building a bridge to transfer legal concepts uh, from one to the other. So um, I think what we have established before is that uh, art now is a financial, is a new financial asset class alongside traditional investment classes, such as securities, bonds, or collectibles. Um, and this has developed over the last years with now more than 50% of collectors saying that for them, investment returns and portfolio diversification is a very strong motivation for even entering the art market. And um, when you compare annual return numbers, uh, I think the art market does not have to shy away comparing to um, other asset classes. So um, now art has been recognized, or art is used as a hedge against inflation and as a way of uh, indeed, diversifying the portfolio, given that there is no direct correlation uh, with other indexes uh, or stock exchanges directly. But again, um, we're not going to dive more into detail at this point, also because Christine already very well explained um, the development of art and finances in the last years this morning. But let me quickly uh, move on to what is going to be the core of my presentation, which is uh, investors protection, investors legal protection. Um, because now that we have established the apparent vicinity of the art and financial market, uh, I think that we shall examine more closely the conditions of investment in each market. And in particular, um, the level of protection that is attributed in each market to investors. So first and foremost, in order to decide um, whether financial markets and the art market provide for a more or less similar level of protection to investors, we would have to establish, first of all, what is the need of protecting investors in both markets and first now in, uh, in the art market. Um, there are many parameters of establishing how um, much protection is needed in a market. However, I will just focus for now on the two uh, of complexity and susceptibility for market manipulation and potentially harmful practices. 
so starting with complexibility, uh, complexity. Um, what is generally assumed is that the more complex a market becomes, the more protection is needed for the investors. So how do you um, evaluate the level of complexity? Well, I, uh, let me introduce you at this point to the recital 83 of the Markets and Financial Instruments Directive from 2014, which in its abbreviated version is just called MIFID, which we're going to refer, on, refer to from now on. Um, MIFID says, or MIFID uh, points to uh, what I think very practical mean of measuring complexity of a market, which is indeed the time an investor has to dedicate in order to become acquainted with the topic. So the more time you need to read and understand the subject before you're willing to invest in it or before you're able to make a sound investment decision is um, the measurement for deciding how much protection a market needs. And um, at this point, I would argue that hardly any investment market can compete in terms of complexity with the art market. Um, I know we hear um, art professionals today, but I think even they agree that um, understanding art or even a segment of art requires years of study and being able to make a decision in terms of investment that even pays off in financial uh, profits is something that is subject to lifelong learning. So uh, from this point of view, considering complexity, art market would require uh, an, a level, an evaluated uh, level of regulation. But let's move on now to the second point, which was susceptibility of the market for manipulation and harmful practices. Um, this referring to the vulnerability of the art market being used by some of its market participants uh, in order to take advantage of others uh, and thereby willingly undermining certain uh, natural market mechanisms. Um, so in this regard, the Basel Art Trade Guidelines of 2018 uh, have established that in comparison with other trade sectors, the art market faces a higher risk of exposure to dubious trade practices. Um, the question arises, why is that? Um, well, there, of course, there is a large variety of reasons to say why the art market, market is particularly susceptible for dubious trade practices, but um, for obvious constraints in time and space, in this PowerPoint, I will just limit myself to the following four points. So first of all, um, what makes it difficult to um, oversee transactions and um, judge their reasonableness, of course, first of all, is complexity, as we have said earlier, um, which is strongly linked to the next point, which is the involvement of intermediaries. Uh, intermediaries indeed play a key role in the art market, um, and they often assume the role of an art advisor. Uh, and for people who, especially for people who are new to the art market, who don't have the time to um, become deeply acquainted with the art market in detail, which I think is a major, or which I suppose is a majority of potential investors, hiring an intermediary is key um, in order to protect the investor's interest and also, for example, to negotiate on the principal's behalf. So in that, um, for in some transactions, the principal may not even be uh, nominated by name or may not even have to reveal his identity or her identity, which leads to the next point, um, which is anonymity, uh, another big issue in the art market um, that has, as a trend, initially been established in the 1980s, where clients are free to participate in the bidding process without being present in the auction room, for example, um, and which continues still today. You may still uh, continue today to be uh, um, not to having to reveal who you are by bidding on the phone, at least not to the open public, but we'll see later uh, in which term now you actually have to reveal your real identity. So um, the principle of anonymity is very closely linked to the principle of discretion um, which is an in, de in deeply ingrained practice in the art market. Um, the idea of discretion or confidentiality, as it is also referred to, 
is a, uh, handed down by some highly praised custom in the Arab world that consists in not revealing the identity uh, of one or even of both parties to the public. And some would argue that discretion is what distinguishes the art market from others and thereby uh, keeps it alive as it is appreciated by clients who enter the art market precisely on this premise, on the promise of being anonymous and um, at least equally held high by dealers who do not want to, uh, first of all, scare off their clientele and second, reveal the identity of their partners in business, since this is one of their most essential assets in um, dealing in the art market. So uh, last but not least, of course, we have also the point of subjective pricing mechanisms um, in the art market that make it harder to monitor and predict price developments. And this, of course, refers to the fact um, that usually there is one individual work of a kind, so there is no uh, market value to it, if you want to. There's um, the art prices or the prices in the art world are always um, subject to, to personal inclinations, to fashion, um, so it's very hard to uh, evaluate in retrospective whether a price was justified or not. Um, so in light of all that has been said so far, uh, it becomes clear that sums invested in the art market are scarcely subject or can scarcely be subject of scrutiny by regulatory bodies, given how unpredictable price developments are. And uh, viewing all of this together, one may see, uh, or one may see that the, all the points that were just raised relate to the umbrella term of a lack of transparency, which the art market has stood reprimanded of for a long period of time, and which indeed is still perceived even by those uh, who have already who are already part of the art market, as is shown here in the survey conducted by Deloitte um, and published in its uh, fin art and finance report in 2019. Since here, 67% uh, of collectors name lack of transparency as one of the most threatening challenges to the art market. Uh, this, of course, um, or this is strongly intertwined with the other um, phenomena also as, um, emerging from the lack of transparency, which, for example, is insider dealing and secret commissions and undisclosed conflicts of his interest all of which are very closely related to the lack of transparency. Um, usually in the market, when there is detected a lack of transparency that commonly goes hand in hand with a loss of trust by investors, uh, since when investors see that not invasion information is not sufficiently available, uh, they uh, become skeptical of investing more money since it is not foreseeable where this, uh, how this investment will go. So usually when this arises, uh, what happens is that the legislator installs new regulatory systems that reduce asymmetries of information and increase transparency. Um, and this can very well be seen from what happened in Europe and the US and many, many other countries in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. Because here, in response to loss of, loss of investors' trust in the financial system, the EU legislator installed a vast legislative framework for financial markets, which included um, directives such as uh, MIFID, uh, but even MAR, MAT, or EMIR, and you name them. Um, so all of these are specifically targeted uh, the lack of transparency and had as a primary objective to reinstall trust in the art market through extensive monitoring documentation and disclosure rules. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot that. Um, and when you look at these uh, objectives of these directives, of these regulatory frameworks in the EU, you see that each of the points that had previously been detected or that had by us now previously detected in the art world, uh, meaning insider trading, for example, secret commissions, money laundering, lack of transparency in general, all of these points have been subject to regulation in financial market systems following the financial crisis, uh, which is generally a good thing. Only that, oh, sorry, only that these regulatory 
instruments don't apply to the art market, of course, because uh, the scope of financial market regulation is limited to financial instruments. Uh, and art in its conventional form, at least pine art, for example, does not qualify for uh, being a financial instrument. Uh, whether this changes now with new emerging form of art, as we have mentioned, for example, earlier, the NFTs remains to be seen, but you, um, basically uh, fine art does not qualify for being subject to regulations of financial market and therefore is not uh, covered by the approaches of EU regulators of dealing with the problems earlier detected. Well, um, that is with one exception because um, they're following the, or in 2018, the European legislator uh, decided to extend one directive, which was the anti-money laundering directive to the art market and has thereby um, taken a pioneering role in the world uh, to, ex to extend financial market regulation also to the art market. And we're gonna say a little bit more on that now. Um, so before 2018, the Anti-Money Laundering and Terrorist Financing Directive addressed principally um, credit institutions, financial institutions, and the like players of the art market. However, following 2018, um, the scope was extended to now also include, and now a side person's trader actors acting as intermediaries in the trade of works of art, including when this is carried out by art galleries and auction houses, where the value of the transaction or a series of linked transaction amounts to 10,000 euros or more. And additionally, persons storing, trading or acting as intermediaries in the trade of works of art, when this is carried out by free ports, where the value of the transaction or a series of linked transaction amounts to 10,000 euros or more. Um, this example, of, I have to say at this point um, that for Europe, this indeed uh, was a, uh, a legal revolution. However, um, France in this case was first uh, because in France, uh, art market professionals had already been addressed by anti money laundering regulations since 2001. Um, however, Europe and France were followed later by new regulatory approaches on anti-money laundering regulation also by the US, who only in last December uh, finally decided to um, incorporate not the art market in general, but only the antiquities market following a long discussion into um, their um, Bank Secrecy Act through the Corporate Transparency Act that was enacted as part of the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, awareness on this topic was raised earlier by, or by an earlier published a report uh, highlighting the risk of the art market for money laundering. And right now, um, the, um, the inclusion of the art market into this part of the legislation is still under scrutiny as uh, it was, um, the, the task was given to examine the possible um, or the extent of money laundering uh, activities in the art market. So that might still happen in the future. Um, once you qualify as an addressee under any anti money laundering directive, there are several obligations that you have to fit, which is, uh, which are, for example, enhanced customer due diligences, meaning that art market professionals under the anti money laundering directive in Europe now have to identify the beneficial owner of each transaction. So that in this way, you no longer have to, or may satisfy, may be satisfied by just naming the intermediary who acts on behalf of someone else. But the uh, auction house, for example, has to inquire as who sh shall become the ultimate beneficial owner, thereby attributing or contributing to transparency in the art market. Moreover, there are now mandatory disclosure rules uh, installed, which means that art professionals have to report to local financial intelligence units any suspicious transaction uh, that maybe has been detected by them as potentially involving money laundering or uh, terrorist financing. And there has been a common reporting system installed by all the member states. So as you can see from this, um, 
what how is the problem of lack of transparency in the art market approached well there is the proposal of in fact extending financial market regulations however this comes uh, hand in hand with the duties of monitoring and reporting and of course disclosure and at this point it has to be um, considered that the art market indeed indeed is subject to its very own rules and um, it is still to be decided whether these reporting and um, monitoring and disclosure obligations are compatible with the principle of confidentiality in the art market. Um, the again, as I mentioned in the very beginning, I will not answer to this question right now, but I will only leave you with uh, the following quotation, which is by Erlen Kager, an art collector and adventurer who in an interview with the journal Blau in 2015 said, I admit I enjoy that. Insider trading, price manipulations, cartels, all of which would get you arrested in other economic fields is common practice in the art market. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for respecting the time. <laughs> Thank you. So we are going to switch quickly to Sarah Bakali, uh, who is going to uh, make the last presentation, and we are going to go to the past and to Lebrun uh, and speculation in the past. Thank you, Sarah. Is it okay, Sarah? Are you? Can you hear me? Yes, it's okay. It's perfect. And do you see my presentation? Um, oh, for the moment, there is nothing on the on the screen. Um, yes, it's okay. That's perfect. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Hello to everybody. <laughs> so let's start. Um, the art market and its play during the French Revolution remains a little studied subject compared to the one. Uh, during the second half of the 18th century, 19th century, and here to the 20th century. Generally, the interest is focused on collecting, on the history of taste and commercial practices, but rarely on the financing of this activity. It is for this reason that I found the topic of this workshop particularly fascinating. To understand the tricky issue of the financial structures of the art market during the French Revolution, I am going to present to you some rather exceptional documents kept at the New York Historical Society Library and at the Yale University. They trace all the stages of a speculative operation set up by two Americans who bought old masters painting in Paris in 1795 with the aim of exporting them to London. These documents illustrate in a very enlightening way a whole series of practices linked to the business world and which extend to the art market. We will first look at the circumstances surrounding the birth of the partnership between Lebrun, Trumbull and Parker and why presenting the various archival documents, the different stages of the speculative operation as well as the origin of the fund advanced. We will conclude by taking a closer look at the collection itself and asking how the selective works can constitute safe investment. The Akin book whose cover you can see here is entitled Pictures and Books, 1795, D. Parker and G.T. These are Daniel Parker and John Trumbull, two Americans, one from Massachusetts and the other from Connecticut. If we have a little information on Daniel Parker, apart from the fact that he got rich during the Revolutionary War, by selling home that he also invested like many Americans in national property he is purely a businessman. The second one, on the other hand, has a more atypical profile. He's the son of the governor of Connecticut. He first went to the continent to be taught uh, by the painter Benjamin West in the 1780s. You can see here a self-portrait uh, exhibited at uh, Yale. Alongside his artistic education, he was introduced to politics by his father, Jonathan Trumbull, a close friend to, of George Washington. Trumbull Jr. 
subsequently made numerous visits to Europe, notably in 1794, when he followed John Jay to London to negotiate agreements with Great Britain that led to the G Treaty. The following year, during a visit to Paris, he built up the collection which was put up for sale two years later in London. Let us briefly review the circumstances that led to this partnership. Indeed, it was during one of his first trips to Paris in 1785 that he met one of the key players in this affair, the dealer Jean-Baptiste Pierre Lebrun, almost by chance. Lebrun opened him the door to all the principal artists and connoisseurs in Paris and introduced him to most beautiful painting in the French capital, as well as to all the key players in the field of ancient and modern paintings. In a letter to his former mentor, Benjamin West, Trumbull explained that he had benefited from the assistance of Lebrun judgment and most of them from celebrated collections. The idea of investing in old master's paintings certainly came from Lebrun, who was not new to the business. Even before the end of the Ancien Regime, he had made a specialty in importing and exporting artwork at the Dulwich College or the Kudman family archives testify. We remember in particular the famous letter kept at the Custodia Foundation, and you can see here in the middle of this chart, in which Lebrun denied being a painter dealer in order to avoid paying any patent. Concerning his activity as an intermediary with foreign collectors, he wrote, quote, various art lovers are afraid of being deceived if they were dealing with what is rightly called a dealer. So they ask me to guide them, to bid for them and to acquire. I do this with pleasure. And certainly I do not have to pay a patent when I do not get any wage from my compl complacency. For any consult me and ask me to collect the money to enter the restoration of the purchase they make. I do this for the success of trade and the benefit of my country. And I only get the pleasure of obliging Witness 150 paintings which are now with me and which belong to Mr. Crawford, English, and which were bought from various dealers. It is true that the art dealer was very active on all fronts and that on many occasions he assisted amateur foreigners or speculators, sometimes even both, in their acquisitions, few are as well documented as our present case. He will not only have uh, the account book that traced each stage and each financing of the operation, but also the letter that Trumbull addressed to his partner in which he provides numerous details, explains his choices, and recreates the opinion of his associates and financiers. I therefore retrieved all these papers from the New York Historical Society Library and from the Sterling Library at Yale. There is a large collection of papers there related to the Trumbull family, correspondence, family and financial documents, etc. This enormous documentation allows us to illustrate this speculative adventure in a unique way. Of course, we will not be able to discuss and present all the documents we have, both because of time constraint and because this is a work in progress. Here is the account book preserved at the New York Historical Society Library. You can see the pages that correspond to the building of the collection. The left hand page shows the financial operation and provider for the operation, namely Dallard and Swan and Nathanael Cutting, to which we will return. Also shown are the rates of exchange in Assigna, the various deposits received in chronological order. The right hand page concerns the suppliers of paintings and we saw in a previous intervention to what point they were practically all linked to the networks of the dealer Lebrun. In the same book, we find copies of letters from Trumbull to Parker in which he detailed the causes of operation uh, and in the letter uh, of the 29th March, he mentioned the amount of this purchase to date and his ambition to increase the initial investment by soliciting additional funds from the first Dallard and Swan. In the following letter dated 4 April 1795, we learned that Trumbull bought uh, for uh, 1,091 to 
120 pounds worth of painting which were sent to Lebrun in charge of packing. We also discovered that contrary to what the dealer implied in the famous letter in which he contested the patent, that was to be imposed on him, his services are not free. Quote, many of the pictures are bought literally at the hard money price, so they are, in my opinion, a very great bargain. Notwithstanding the terms which Mr. Lebrun opts from us, that is 10 percent on the purchase and one third on the profit. I have not agreed absolutely to this until I shall have consulted you. I think it high, but we must consider that with the addition of this commission, the pictures are still very cheap, that without his head it would have been impossible to have done so well. And that we, I have no doubt that what we get for 1,000 will sell at least for 3,000. This profit is still handsome. So who are these financiers who supply Trumbull with funds so that it can go bargain and ting? The names that appear on the pages of this account book concerning the financing of the collection are those of Nathaniel Cutting and Alard and Swan here. There are many other involved, but we cannot present all of them as we do not have the time and sometimes we do not have enough information. We can nevertheless underline that they are American businessmen who went to France in order to invest in Bien National. The case of Swan and Dollars is particularly interesting. This house was created by James Swan who associated himself with the Baron d'Allard, a French deputy, a former elected member of the Etat Généraux, who dropped this particle and given the context, this can easily be understood. James Swan, whose portrait you can see here, painted by Gilbert Stuart, is much better documented and for good reason. He wrote a number of reports to the Committee of Supply and proposed, in particular, to reduce the state debt and provide the country with basic necessities to exchange them for luxury goods, wine, and brandies. He obtained the authorization to proceed with this type of exchange in 1794, and it is that one can find in the Boston Fine Art Museum where his portrait is preserved, with furniture and other decorative objects coming straight out for the gardener. You can see some of these pieces here, including this series of furniture delivered in 1787 to Marc-Antoine Thierry de Ville d'Avry, Intendant General of the Garde Meubles de la Couronne, whose flat in the Hotel de la Marine will soon be open to the public. Uh, this aside is not gratuitous. It brings us to the tricky issue of transporting this artwork in a hostile, hostile context. Let us recall the protestation against the loss of treasures that could have enriched the museum or the state treasury. It was a time of witch hunting, and by participating to such operations, Lebrun could easily appear as a, a traitor to the nation, whereas he was not shy about denouncing his colleagues or calling for great vigilance in this area. The risk of being suspected and arrested was not the only thing that could obstruct this kind of business. The risks associated with shipping were increasing, and to avoid capture and seizure by the British, the goods are to be carried under a neutral flag and on the property of a neutral country citizen. The complete neutralization of ships and shipmen was the only way for traders to continue some of their activities. The instruction given by Trumbull in a letter he addressed to a certain Monsieur de Lamotte, American consul in La Le Havre de Grasse, testified to the necessity of transporting his goods on a neutral ship. Quote, in six days from the date you will receive by a wagon, which left town yesterday, 12 cases of pictures and drawing, of which a lease is enclosed, and which I beg you will ship on board the first good American vessel bound from your port to Guernsey to the address of Monsieur Langa, agent of the American consulate. Then he followed here. You will be careful that the vessel on board which you ship them be bona fide American and the papers perfectly clear. And if it be necessary that the cases be opened at the custom house at Havre, I beg you will take the trouble to see that it is 
done with great care are the articles of valuable and easily damaged. The bills of flooding will be made out in conformity with the enclosed memorandum for account and risk of John Trumbull of Lebanon, Connecticut, United States of America. As for all the expenses related to the transport of the cases, the archives kept as a sterling library at Yale contain all the correspondence receipts. This includes an account of expenses for the receipt and shipment of 12 picture cases received from Paris and loaded on the ship Harmony. We even learned the name of the captain, Samuel White, the amount of the carriage charge, the carriage in shop, the custom and shipping charges, the rate of a clerk in charge of opening the cases at the custom, the cost of storage, that of the cases, etc. Each operation was meticulously recorded, making it possible to appreciate all the logistics involved in this type of business. Lebrun took charge of almost everything, which suggests that he was very experienced in this field. This must have been an important factor in deciding both Trumbull and Parker to embark on this venture, but also to invest such important funds. But what other factor might have motivated this financial to support them? In an economically unstable context, which renting could be considered as safe haven? This is the subject of our final section. The invoice used to secure the value of the merchandise gives us an idea of the criteria considered by Trumbull, Parker and their support, and the main one might have obviously been the pedigree of the artwork, its provenance. This is indicated on the invoice as you can see here. The provenance is mentioned when the work is worth seeing as a guarantee of its artistic value. Each lot is marked with the expert estimate and it, this is Lebrun, a second important point that probably comforted the partners and financiers. The expertise and conversation of the dealer Lebrun, who had recently been working on the formation of national collection, Future Louvre, were firmly established in Paris, all the more we, he had just published a collection devoted to Flemish and Dutch painting that you can see here, in which he was one of the most important conversers of the time. Trumbull carries 100 editions of this famous publication in his cases, as you can see on this extract of um, invoice. Uh, so prestigious provenance, appraised by a fine connoisseur. All we need to do is to ask about the works likely to have an important commercial value. Um, you can see a rather eclectic sample here, Italian, French, Nordic painting, History, portrait, genre painting. Sarah, sorry yes. to interrupt, but could you uh, conclude quickly? Otherwise, we couldn't have time to a discussion. So, yeah, I will conclude really soon. Thank you. Don't... So, the catalog of the 1797 list 91 laws, picture from the Flemish and Dutch school, are more representative than any other school. Conclusion. But the most important part of the collection is therefore northern painting, which is not surprising given this, that in the second half of the 18th century, northern painting had been considered as more reliable in terms of attribution. It was therefore a more reliable investment, especially as the most prominent specialist in this school of painting was the one who chose them. However, Lebrun is not mentioned at all in the Crucisse catalogue. Perhaps this was done in order to preserve him, given the French political context, or to avoid giving a negative image of the association by a too much explicit uh, association with our dealers, often suspected of taking advantage of collectors' distress. It seemed preferable to give credit and taste for this collection to John Trumbull by mentioning only his activity of painter. One only has to read that very long title of the catalog to realize it. Quote, a catalog of a most superb and distinguished collection of Italian, French, Flemish, and Dutch pictures, a selection formed with peculiar taste and judgment by John Trumbull during his late residence in Paris from some of the most celebrated cabinet in France. End of quote. We conclude our presentation with an evocation of the auction that dispersed an ephemeral collection gathered only two years earlier.
Let us underline the fact that if the initial plan of the operation seems well mastered by the protagonist, the London follow-up was not uh, as uh, organized. Uh, inspired by the dispersal of the Orléans collection, the partners planned to sell in the whole collection in London, but things did not go that well and tremble, had to face many difficulties and even misfortune and to adapt to the circumstances. That is another story and I will be and will be the subject, maybe, of another presentation, I hope. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Sarah, and sorry for the interruption. Uh, so I think uh, we can have uh, some minutes before the break, a small break, in order to have a discussion. So I quickly open the discussion if there are some questions. Yes, and Sophie. <laughs> Thank you very much to both of you for the great presentations. Uh, Antonia, I have a question regarding have you been considering in your research also the role of uh, reputational mechanism within the art market and compliance mechanism as well? We know that the art market is quite opaque and there are, uh, there, yeah, there is a lot of opacity and potential for frauds and, but there is also this reluctance to, from art market players to, uh, to get yeah, that kind of regulation. And I'm asking because uh, I've been working a little bit on another regulation in France uh, with a specific decrease to protect uh, the buyers against misattributions or errors in authentications of old masters. No, actually in any kind of works, not only old masters. Uh, this is the Marcus decree. And we have been trying to assess the impact of this regulation on the French market. And all, one of our conclusion is that it didn't make a big impact actually. Um, and we argue that it's because reputational mechanisms are there with, in this case, the auction houses. Um, so in a way, they find balance. Uh, so I was just wondering, what do you think about reputational mechanism and compliance mechanism? Mm. Um, thank you very much for this question. Thank you uh, to both of you for your contributions to this panel. I have some questions later, but let me first ask, uh, answer your question. Um, when I started out uh, writing about the PhD, I was indeed, or the aim of the project was to examine whether indeed um, exterior regulation would present an advantage to, for example, self-regulation. And this is where I um, started digging a little more into uh, the RAM initiative and other initiatives of self-regulation. Um, and in the end, it came out that this would probably be a little too much for um, the years of the PhD that I had planned uh, if I included not only exterior regulation, but also self-regulation. Um, indeed, I have not been able to come to a conclusion yet whether um, strict regulation, like formal regulation, is an option for the art market. Uh, the more I get to know the art market, the more indeed I have the feeling that although following overall trends, even financial market trends, it is subject to its very own rules and it cannot be um, even though the problems uh, seem alike, it cannot be treated like any other market. Uh, so I think the compliance mechanisms and reputational mechanisms are a very valid choice, um, but I um, am unfortunately not qualified for giving you a more extensive answer for them. Thank you, thank you very much. If, if I may, I have just a quick other okay, another question. Um, if we consider this, again, vertical differentiation of the art market. So, of course, we understand that it's necessary to regulate the, low, again, the high-end market because this is where there is, they are the uh, most important money transfers and risk for money laundering. But if we look in terms of buyer's protection, if you look at the low-end market, yeah. so we have all, so often, you know, this artificial, okay, it's about 10,000 euros for mm -hmm. sale rights, it's about 2,000 euros, uh, it depends. But on the other end, for buyers in the low end markets, you can be cheated or you can also, you know, you don't have the same amount of money, but you are making big loss if you are, yeah, again, cheated or something like this. So what do you think about that? 
I I find it very interesting, and I was kind of getting. I was going to ask you a direct a, a question that goes into the same direction. Uh, usually, when you ask whether something should be regulated, you always consider the effect, or I would consider the effect on the overall market. So, providing more market stability and maybe more market efficiency, if this is what you want, and of course the protection aspect. So, the aspect of protection of investors and at this point very much consumers. Uh, especially if you talk about the, I would say, low-end market. So um, whenever this topic comes up, I of, very often have the um, the reply, not only by by people who are professionals, but even if I talk to people who are not involved in the art market, why do you even want to regulate this if these are indeed the people um, who have so much money so we can probably pay the lawyer too? Uh, why should it be stronger regulated? Um, I think it is very, a very interesting topic. As in, in terms of consumer law, you don't differentiate between how much financial means people have available. Um, but it does give it another justification trend to me if you say that uh, lots of people are indeed um, running risks investing in the art market, which is of course, an, an essential point of why you have to regulate the financial market, because now that it is regulated, more people try to enter the market and uh, feel safe by the safety net that has been provided by European legislation. And the question is whether you want to give this initiative to, to people to enter the art market and maybe um, not starting with works that cost more than 50 cents, but for a start with a low end art market. Um, so I would actually like very much to hear your thoughts about it, given that you have um, in detail examined the low end art market and have just, as you told, because uh, if you have just been involved in this project on regulation, um, you probably have an opinion on that too. Philip, do you want to intervene? I see you have a question. Um, yes, not necessarily following up on, on the discussion between uh, uh, and, and, and Antonia and, and Sophie. And by the way, thank you all for your presentations. I do have a question about the low-end market aspect of uh, and Sophie, you know, which is very interesting. It's, it does seem to uh, be somewhat unexplored or unexplored aspect of, uh, of of the art world. And you mentioned a few studies, but you know, I was immediately thinking about historical examples: the 17th century Dutch Republic which is supposedly the first mass market for paintings uh, in Europe. And there's some very interesting work, as, as, I'm, as I'm sure you very well know, by Michael Montias, uh, Neil Demarkey, Hans van Miegeloot, and so forth, looking at the mechanism of that, um, of that particular art market. And I was wondering, so first of all, if you see some parallels there. And the second question is, yes, I think there's, it's, it's quite clear that there's a, um, a quite a, a bit of activity in the uh, market for cheaper works of art these days. And I was wondering to what extent you think that is, can, be, can be attributed to advances in technology, whereby platforms operating sort of two-sided markets with art, artificial intelligence, actually making it very easy uh, for people to buy and sell art. And that leads me to maybe a concluding question is that, well, you know, I know several people, including myself, are buying things at Katawiki, but none of us, re as far as I know, resell, ever resell works of art. And so I have a little bit of doubt with the, so the supposed investment uh, potential uh, of these works. I'm happy with the cultural capital and the social capital, you know, otherwise why we do it. But I'm not sure, yes, in theory there's investment potential, but I'm not sure that's a primary motive for people active uh, in, in, in that market set. Thank you very much, Philippe. Uh, of course, for the uh, literature on the early modern art market, it's, it's going to be the basis. I didn't mention that here in this discussion, but this is definitely something I will look at. And of course, it is it is the low end market of the patronage system in the past. Uh, but actually, yeah, in fact, we could even discuss that because was it the is the free market? So we know Antwerp, Mechelen uh, in the 16th century. Is it because we have the low end market, which was the commission system, then the emergence of the free market. And I'm wondering if you can see, you know, also some, is it the low end market of the past or the, the high end market, you know, by opposition to patronage? Because if we look at, um, I would assume that very, very cheaper 
paintings that we know that many disappeared, especially on Tuklane, and these uh, paintings who were very fragile and didn't pass the test of time. So maybe that was the low end market, and we maybe don't have any evidence today of this low end market in the 16th century. So I think it, that's an interesting question that we might look at to see if this trade, this exploitation of cheaper, indeed cheaper paintings, the, where is that the high hand market of the past or already the low end? I think there is a nice question. I would assume that for really cheap paintings, it's even worse to get data about that because we know how hard it is to get data in the 16th century about these paintings quantitative data. So I would assume that these paintings are not even longer available. Um, but this is something we, we can discuss. For the second one with the two-sided platform, of course, it has played a role. What I was surprised in my research is that many of antique dealers um, jumped into the uh, digital era before the crisis. And they really want to renew uh, also their I image. And, and it's not an hazard, right? Because when I um, conducted the interviews, most of them are young people now. It's no longer the dusty stereotypes of antique dealers, at least in my, uh, in my, uh, in the age. But I think there are a like this. And if you read some press like Collect in Belgium, you will see there is a full papers on the new generation of antique dealers. And I think it's not only digital platform, but also a new way of branding the antique market, which makes things more appealing. I think it's a lot about branding in this case. If you can show that, yes, buying a, a Delft blue or Valsambar glass, it's something beautiful that you can have for a cheaper price in your um, apartment. Why to buy something at Ikea? I think there is this um, thing um, happening right now with newer generation, especially in, with the uh, Y generation in particular. Um, and yeah, I, I think that uh, perhaps I would like to ask one question to Sarah and after you can have the break. But Sarah, uh, in your presentation, you deal with uh, old uh, antiques, old market. And uh, in your opinion, what, what do you think about the necessity of regulation on the market? Because you studied a completely different market uh, with different transactions. And what do you think about this need of regulation? I think that your opinion on this could be quite interesting. What do you think about that, Sarah? <laughs> Uh, it's a tricky question about regu regulation of our market uh, in contemporary art or uh, well, you have you have a, a look of speculation on speculation on the art market with your experience uh, all time and transaction and today it's quite different because uh, we have speculation we have the stock market and this necessity of regulation but as we see that in all times we also had this kind of speculation do you think that it is because the art market evolved as uh, the stock market that we need regulation or not? Because you saw that in previous time, we also had speculation. You see what I mean? Do you see what I mean? Maybe. Uh, um, I, um, in, in my period, it is a, it's a really compl complicated period. And uh, the need of regulation is based on uh, the uh, the uh, complexity of uh, the, in the instability, economical and political, mm -hmm. and uh, the, um, the, the flight of uh, many, many national treasures. So the need of regulation is, uh, is, uh, is really present in my, uh, in my time. So uh, each day there is a new rule uh, uh, on, on the art market and the, uh, the uh, painting, uh, um, painting market, but, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have any opinion on the uh, contemporary uh, issues market. I don't know. It's um, to to try to build bridge in the in this case. Yes. Uh, um, Sophie, perhaps Anne Sophie seems to have an idea on the topic, and we could conclude on on this before mm -hmm. having the break. <laughs> you can, Anne Sophie, if you have. A, we didn't hear. sorry sorry excuse me this is also to try to bridge some to create some bridges um in your amazing doc document that you have uh, there are, if, if i'm not mistaken there are sometimes very different prices right in the 
how do you explain that that some in that case much cheaper paintings were also uh sent to the us i mean how do you explain such price is difference in terms of paintings if it was only for an investment purpose we might expect only valuable highly valuable paintings but maybe i i, I didn't see uh, it properly but yeah i don't know if you have anything to on say on my on, on my uh, account book yeah you, you mean yeah okay uh, there is different level of painting we have uh, a really uh, high estimated uh, painting of Raphael, which is uh, the top of uh, the uh, the, the, the painting bought by uh, by uh, the two um, Trumbull and Parker, but you have also um, uh, genre painting which are less estimated and uh, and uh, less important pr uh, provenance is that uh, that the can explain the difference of uh, prices, but uh, and then paint uh, yeah. The, the main characteristic, the main um, thing is the provenance, I think, for the value. So, Thank you. But uh, many of these paintings, it was a fail, so many of these paintings were not sold in in um, in London because they were too high uh, estimated. So he had to keep it with him and ex wait it for a better time, you know. So perhaps I'm going to ask Benedict what she thinks about all that because, because we are very late. <laughs> yes, well, um, we're happy to continue all the questions in the chat inside the workshop uh, during the break. Um, there are also lots of questions from YouTube, which I haven't had time to relay, uh, but I'm going to ask our panelists to multitask and start answering them on the YouTube live, if you can. They're specifically directed to each one of you. Um, and we're going to take a very short three minute break, um, during which uh, we're, we're going to try to prepare ourselves for um, session six, uh, which, it, um, sorry, session four, digitization and new financial structures. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. It was really great for the presentation. <laughs>